Matt Simmons is the he's one of the owners of Curbside Laundries, which is a software and a POS system that supports the commercial laundry a segment of the business. Also is a laundromat owner. Really, really a special treat to have an expert like this on. One of the best wash and fold people there is in the country. So really a treat. And with that said, Matt, I'll turn it over to you and you can kind of take it from here. Great. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And well, thanks all the folks, PWS, for giving me the opportunity to speak to everybody here. This is a topic I'm very, very passionate about, which is wash and fold and helping people get started with wash and fold. But it's also focused on helping you grow your business and how to manage the process. A little bit of background. So my brother, Aaron Simmons, and myself, we operate Super Suds, which is located over in Long Beach. We have had the laundromat for about 20 some years. We've taken the wash and fold and grown that exponentially. And I'm gonna be showing, talking about how we grew the business and, and really diving into the nuts and bolts of wash and fold best practices and everything. And as we grew our business, we needed a system in order to manage the business. And that's where we got into, we, we developed our own point of sale specifically made for wash and fold. And then we also developed a pickup and delivery app, which made it very easy for customers to schedule their own pickup and deliveries. And then another big part is we provide a website designed just for laundromats that ranks really well for tons of people across the country. And that's an essential part of your wash and fold business, which we'll get into a little bit later. And so our website, it's curbsidelaundries.com. I also have some webinars and also a podcast, which, you know, they're short five minute vignettes, each with like golden nuggets to kind of take away. And that's at youtube.com forward slash curbside laundries. But let's go ahead and get into wash and fold. So that's our laundromat in the top left corner. So that's uh, super suds. On the this chart right over here is the wash and fold revenue. And so that's from 1999 until today. And you could see things were relatively flat for some time. And then around 2010, that's when we got into building a website for a laundromat. And it wasn't even a very good website, but at that time, that's all you needed was a website. And we really fine tuned the website to get things even better. And now we're doing about $100,000 a month in wash and fold. So about 25% is in-store. So we do about 25,000 a month in in-store wash and fold and 75% is pickup and delivery. But wash and fold is the centerpiece. And it turned out initially when we were getting started, we had somebody else doing the wash and fold at our laundromat and they just fed the machines. And it turned out they were stealing from us, which was the biggest blessing ever because then we took over that side of the business and look at the opportunity. So I really encourage everybody to get into it versus farming it out. Because one thing to keep in mind is it's your reputation. If they do a bad job, it's your reputation that suffers. And this is such a revenue opportunity. Another thing to keep in mind is if you are only doing wash and fold without a strong web presence, the most you're gonna make, and this is true almost across the entire country, is about $2,500 gross, which isn't really making money after you're paying for the attendant. And so a lot of places in the past, they used to do wash and fold simply to help pay for the attendant. So they were choosing, let's have an attended laundry and to help pay their wage, we're going to go ahead and offer wash and fold. But I want the people on the webinar who are listening today to take it one step or 10 or a hundred steps beyond that, which is to make this a part of your business. And the reason why laundromats typically don't make more than 2,400 or 2,500 a month without a strong web presence is because you're marketing to the wrong people. The people going into your laundromat are spending about 10 or 13 cents a pound and wash and fold is a buck 50 or a buck 80 per pound. So it's just a totally different market. So the way to reach those people is through your web presence because people are not driving through Long Beach in our case, looking for a laundromat that does wash and fold. They're online and they, they're typing in, where do I get my clothes done for me? Where, where's wash and fold? So you're not even really selling to people they're already looking for the service. And every month we get about like $2,000 more of people looking for wash and fold. And next month there's gonna be another group of people looking for wash and fold. And every month there are people looking for wash and fold and they're either finding you or your competition. The reason why I have a hot air balloon on the screen is because on one of the Facebook or actually the Coin Laundry Association forum, somebody was saying, nobody could find my laundromat. I'm in a terrible location, it's hidden away, 
But the good news is it doesn't really matter with a web presence. What people suggested for him was to put a big hot air balloon on top of his laundromat. And so people would see that it's there. So kind of metaphorically, having a strong web presence is that big hot air balloon so people could find you. It's just so essential. And I do recommend people doing a search for yourself and seeing if you could find your laundromat online. You have to think about it in terms of what are people looking for? Are they looking for a coin operator, you know, laundromat? You want to show, show up for that? Or self-serve laundromat, do you show up in searches for wash and fold and things like that? So you want to really pay attention. Not only do you show up online, but for what keywords. So if you do a search for wash and fold Long Beach, I highlighted all the search results where supersets came up. These are just things to pay attention to. This goes a little bit techy, but this right over here is called your meta description. And that is the description for that particular page. That needs to be dialed in too because people are deciding whether to click on your link depending on whether or not that's a captivating meta description. So think of that as your little commercial. Does that get people to click on your, on your link? So not only do you wanna show up, but you want to let them know that you're providing them with something relevant to what they're looking for. I could do a whole presentation just about marketing and about SEO and keywords and all that stuff. But the real focus of this is about wash and fold. But I just need, wanted to highlight the importance of your web strategy, your online presence, because that's our number one source of new customers. Just as a little bit of a background, what we did at Super Suds was we went in and paid about twenty to $30,000 for a website which nobody does, no mom and pop laundromat does, but it worked. I mean, that's where we're getting a lot of customers. And what we did was to make that accessible to mom and pop laundromat owners like ourselves was we basically have the website all designed and dialed in and researched what brings laundromats to the front page of Google. We've already done the hard work. Basically for pennies on the dollar, we are able to just customize it and localize it for individual laundromats. So that's, this right over here is the drop-off counter. The top left one, was our old drop-off counter. We did a lot of business through that, but we should have updated it a long time ago. The top right is our new drop-off counter. This is a centerpiece. You know, this is where people are dropping off their clothes. That's a whole business unit. So I like to think of the self-serve as one business unit, the in-store wash and fold as another business unit. And then if you get into pickup and delivery, that'd be another one. One thing I was reading a book about Steve Jobs and he said when he designed the Apple stores, he wanted it where you walk into that front door and you should be able to take it all in. You know, where the music section is, you know, where the hardware is, you know, and you could, you don't have to, you're not getting stuck in a maze like you do at a department store in the mall. So your wash and fold counter should be visible right when you walk in. So you shouldn't have to go look for it, which in the top left corner, it was hidden. I mean, I don't know how we did so well with that, but we're doing better with a better one. Another thing you'll notice is we've got a display right there that shows how many pounds and how many dollars, because you're gonna get people who drop off their clothes and they, or, and they say, well, how much is this gonna be? And you don't wanna ring them up, you just wanna give them a quick answer. So you could drop the clothes in the bin, weigh the clothes, and then you could see exactly, oh, it's 10 pounds, that'll be 20 bucks. So in any case, that's just something handy to have near your drop-off counter is a quick reference guide just to help customers out. On the new countertop, one thing you'll notice is we've got, we use a bin and we put that on top of a scale. So I'll show you a picture of that later, but you'll have to trust me, there's a scale underneath that bin. We made it lower, kind of like the airport. So there's no reason to sling a big heavy bag over the counter. It helps to just put that bag right on top of that, uh, right on top of that bin. And we use the bin because it just makes it easy it, to transport the clothes. We basically put an empty bin so it's ready to weigh the clothes. We clear out the tear weight because the bin weighs something. You don't want to charge them for the bin. And then we could take that bin to the back room and store it that way. So we got our point of sales right there. And it just looks a lot more professional, a lot more because that's a whole business. So get a nice countertop. You want to really guide people in that direction. This over here is the scale. So we use the Mettler Toledo or the Rice Lake shipping scale and it's weights and measured. You need to get one that's weights and measured so it's legal for trade. Then you also want to make sure you get one that has a USB connectivity. That way you're future proofing your scale. These scales are expensive. They're precision instruments. You don't just want to drop big weights on them you know, because that could break the sensors. You want it to have a USB connectivity. So that way, if you do get wash and fold point of sale software, 
you could just plug the scale into the point of sale. And that's important because anytime there's handwriting, you're gonna have mistakes. With handwriting, the, the, the weight, this way it's automatic. And then also I've seen it where some laundromats manually entering it in because you're doing this all day. See, it says 22.5 pounds right there. Well, some places, you know, it's easy for the attendant to write 225 and charge that customer 500 bucks to do their laundry. You know, it happens. And then the customer is not too happy, even if you reverse the charge. A great way to minimize mistakes is to just have everything digital. So the weight is automatically grabbed from the scale. Another thing to pay attention to is the finished product. What does that finished product look like? And I've got a whole podcast episode about what are you selling? Meaning if you look at your Yelp page and your online presence, even your web page, website, a lot of times it's all focused on machines and self-serve, which is great. That's really important. I mean, that's your bread and butter. But if you really want to push wash and fold, you need to show a picture of the finished product because that's part of what you're selling. On the left is an example of somebody's finished product right there. And that's not quite done right. And I'll show you why. But on the right, that's done really well. So that's one of our clients, the laundry, laundry room over in Culver City. Just some differences. On the right, you've got some nice packages. They're not too big. They're easy to carry. If somebody gave you a big, big bag, that might not be so convenient to carry into, you know, to unload and unpack because it's too heavy. So it's nice to use smaller bags that are easily divisible. And then on the left side of what not to do, besides the bag being too big, the clothes aren't really folded too nicely. They're just kind of thrown in there. And you could see the Calvin Klein undergarments. And again, those are not something you want prominently displayed. There's a business operator who runs a great route. His name is Kent Wells over in Seattle. And he likes to pack, and I like doing the same thing, the pants and the shorts on the bottom, the unmentionables in the middle, and then on top you have the shirts. And one thing we do as well at Supersets for collared shirts is we hang them. Just something to keep in mind. Think about the presentation. How does it look? That is really important because that's how they're going to judge the product. Another part is you want to wash every order separately. That way it's just more sanitary. It's a benefit to the customer. Sometimes if a customer questions the price, like why is this so expensive? And you could let them know, you know, it's labor intensive to fold the clothes. It takes a lot of time. And also we wash everybody's orders separately. And that makes people have an aha moment because then they think about, well, maybe that other guy that's 99 cents a pound, maybe they're just throwing everything into the same wash. Another thing to keep in mind is how are you folding your clothes? And however you fold them, you should be consistent. If you go to McDonald's, you, it's always the same and people like that consistency. And the same thing with folding your clothes at your laundromat. So if you're wondering how do you fold the clothes, there are a lot of folding clothes videos on YouTube. Find the ones you like the best and create one for each type of garment and have your attendants watch it or train one and then have the, that person train your other employees. It's really important to be consistent because your customers are going to think however you do it, that's the right way. If the clothes get done differently next time, you know, the socks are folded differently, the towels are folded differently, they're going to think, wait, what's wrong? Or I want the last person who folded my clothes to do it. So it's really important to keep it consistent. And then in regards to detergents, we're kind of married to Tide for, for better or for worse. So Tide is a great product. It smells good. Customers really like the smell of it. The downside is it's really expensive. We tried switching one time and we got negative customer feedback. I do recommend if you're just getting started with wash and fold, figure out what type of detergent you're going to use and stick with it because switching is not easy. If you do offer Tide, maybe make that a premium product where they could pay an extra 25 cents or 15 cents per pound. You want to be consistent with your detergent just like you are with the folding. And you also want to offer some options such as free and clear for people who are the hyperallergenic so if they're allergic to things, you want options there as well. You also want to avoid wrinkles. So one way to avoid wrinkles is to avoid what's in this photo. I see it happen all the time at laundromats when they're doing wash and fold, where they're just yanking stuff out of the dryer and throwing it. They do it kind of like how I do it at home, which is I just throw the clothes into the basket. What happens in that situation are the clothes are going to get wrinkled. The way to do it is when you unload the dryer, it's really important to keep your clothes flat. And so you can see on the left as we're unloading the dryer, we're putting the shirts and we're stacking them up on top of each other. We're keeping everything straight. We're not rolling things into balls and throwing it because as those things dry, they will get wrinkled. So this is a really good system that's worked well for us. And if you notice, even while we're doing this on 
the baskets. We even have them tagged with the order number right there. So I'll go more into detail as far as how to manage the process, how to keep every order organized, because I can't stress that enough. The number one mistake that happens in Wash and Fold is orders get mixed up. And anybody who hasn't mixed up orders is lying to you or they haven't done it yet. Every Wash and Fold customer in store for us is worth about $330. So per year, okay, they're spending at least 330 bucks per year and on average. So if you mix up two orders, you know, you can't just mix up one, it's always two. If you mix up two orders, you run the risk of losing close to $660 a year. So that's a chunk of money. So it's really important to keep every order separated. As far as the plastic bags, we get our plastic bags from Sudsies. So they're located, they're a local uh, vendor, family owned, really good company. And you'll notice these are our bags at Super Suds and we like it nice and tight. The tighter, the better. That way stuff doesn't move around. If your bag is loosey goosey, by the time they throw it in their trunk and they take it out and it moves here, moves there, it's gonna be all over the place and the customer is paying for it to be folded. And if they have to fold it again, then it's not really wash dry fold anymore. So you wanna keep it nice and tight. In addition, I've got this kind of zoomed in. We use those, forget the name for them, but those zip ties or the those, those wires. They sell, they sell those at Sudsies as well. So we put the order in there, we push down on it, we clamp up, cinch up the rubber plastic bag, and then we use that wire to kind of zip tie it. Part of the presentation is your ticket. Are you using a handwritten ticket or a professional receipt? And another thing you'll notice on the ticket is it says how many bags it is. Is it two bags? Is it three bags? A very common mistake that happens is somebody comes to pick up their order and the, your attendant gives them back a bag or two and they get home and they're like, I'm missing a lot of my clothes. And you're like, oh, there's still a bag over here. And they have to drive back to the laundromat, pick up that extra bag, and they're gonna give you a one-star review because that wasn't very convenient. And they paid a lot of money for convenience. You need to have the number of bags on the ticket. So that way, right on the ticket, it says, three bags and you're able to give them back all three bags. With our software and most, I'd say most laundry software, it should have that in there, but that's just one thing to, that's really, really key. So we also provide the wash and fold bag, not, or the, the laundry bags. So we get these over at Cleaner Supply. Cleaner Supply, I think, sells everything supply-wise. Yeah, really good company. We use the 30 inch by 40 inch ones that you see right over here. And you can see we also wash them. So this purple bag, once we're done with it, we actually launder it because I don't want to give somebody back a dirty bag. Everything is nice and clean when it gets returned. If you're selling the bags to customers, and we sell them for seven and a half dollars each, but it's probably time to raise our prices on that. You want to make sure you have a different color bag that you sell to your customers. And, and I mean a different color bag than the ones you use internally. The reason for that is if you're using purple bags and you're selling purple bags, what winds up happening is you're gonna wind up keeping your customer's bag or giving away your bag without the customer paying for it. So we know if a customer gives us a purple bag, we know they paid for it because we use green bags. And you're gonna say, well, why do you even use bags? Well, sometimes customers give you their clothes in like not so good containers that are falling apart, that have holes in them. That's why it's really important to have bags on the premises so you could transfer the customer's clothes over to a sturdy bag. We'll make sure they don't lose their clothes. So yeah, once again, you need two different color bags and they're a good thing to sell. And then as far as what goes on your bag, you wanna have your logo on there, wanna have your address on there. If you're doing pickup and delivery, you wanna say schedule your next pickup at supersuds.com or the name of your website. But I'm not sure the exact cost. Somebody just asked, what's the cost of the bag customized with the name and the logo? I know the bag by itself is two and a half bucks. I believe it's about $5 each if you get it all decked out. All right, so over here we have binning in order. When you first start with wash and fold, most likely what's gonna happen is somebody drops off their clothes and right after they walk out the door, you're gonna just put their clothes into the washing machine. So you don't really need a whole system in place, but it is good to have a system in place because sometimes at five o'clock, everybody comes in at one time and if you don't have a system in place and you just throw both of them into the washing machine, that's when problems happen. All right, I've even seen YouTube videos by laundry professionals who've been doing this for a while and they say, oh, I only do one order at a time. That's because they don't have a system. We put the clothes into the bin, like I showed you before. The reason we use a bin is you can see that photo on the right, that trash bag has a hole in it. 
that came from the customer, or they give you a big straw basket and you don't want that big straw basket in your back room. If you're just stacking the bags of clothes on the ground, which you know we used to, and a lot of places may not have the space, so you got to do what you got to do. What happened to us is sometimes the bags would tip over, socks would fall out, and if somebody else got somebody else's sock, all it takes is one sock or one undergarment, and it's always the small pieces that escape. And if that winds up in somebody else's order, it's actually not the person who lost their underwear that's going to be complaining. It's going to be the person who gets somebody else's undergarment with their order that is really grossed out and they don't, they're going to question everything. That's why we use the bins is that way if something falls out, which happens, it's not getting separated from the order. We also number all of our shelves and in our software, it says Joe's order is on shelf 23. So we're tracking each order from beginning to end. So we know exactly where the order's at, who washed it, who laundered it, what machine was used, everything. And so that's really helpful. In the very beginning, we had to have customers find their own clothes in the back room. I mean, once we got busier and we didn't have software to manage it, so we needed some way of managing it all. So this goes into tracking each order. And somebody just asked, what size bins are those? I'm not sure offhand, but I do know we got them at Costco. They also sell similar ones at Home Depot. This one is completely essential. This, you need to label every order while it's being washed and ride. Once again, the most common mistake is orders get mixed up and that happens at different times in the process. Over here, this is one of our clients, the dirty hamper. The guy is just crushing it and wash and fold and pick up and delivery. And so that's what he's using. He just laminated some paper and he could use dry erase markers. And then on the right, we're using magnetic signs. So we just went to a sign company that make, that could print on magnets and you could do dry erase on that as well. And we just write the order number on it. In this case, we actually just tape the ticket onto it as well. A very important part of this sign to label it is please do not remove. So that, that is essential because what winds up happening is your attendant gets busy, they're doing other things. Then somebody comes along and they see a, an abandoned order. But if it's labeled with a brand of your laundromats, they know, hey, that belongs to Supersets. Maybe I don't want to mess with that because that's the store I'm at. And it says, please do not remove. So that's a totally different thing than just removing a abandoned order and it works. I mean, not every time, but almost every time. So, that, so it needs to say, please do not remove and you want it branded. Then we have the order number on there. Here's another area where orders get mixed up. And I know I'm harping on the mixed up orders things a lot, but if you do it right, it's going to help you. It's going to help you get loyal customers. And it's also going going to help you avoid one-star Yelp reviews because if you know those one-star Yelp reviews could just ruin it for everybody because somebody sees that and then they go to the next place on Google when they're looking for, for the service. So your online reputation is so important. Here's how one way of avoiding mixed up orders. Your attendant needs to not work on two orders at the same time. They need to first load up the machines and let's say it's Bob's orders. So it's best to put Bob's order in there, label the machines, and then move to the next order, which may be Sally's order, and then label the machines. Same thing when moving it to the dryer. Don't move Bob and Sally's orders at the same time and hope you remember which order's in the middle. You know, a lot of times attendants think they're saving time because you, everybody, you're going to not lie to yourself, but you're going to say, oh, I'm going to remember. And then you remember until you don't. And it's so easy to forget whose order's in the middle. So don't even take the chance. You don't want to, there's no upside and you risk losing $600 a year. So you just just got to be real kind of not strict, but just, you know, you really need to emphasize this is how we do it. First load one order, label it, then go and do the next order. And again, the same thing with folding. So just keep the orders separated in that regard. I went on one of the Facebook groups and asked about machine tracking because this part is really, really important for a variety of reasons. Number one, it helps you keep track of which machines they're using. Number two, it, it also keeps track for your own records. So you could keep track of which attendant laundered whose clothes. There's a lot of downstream benefits. If somebody's order gets messed up or this or that, and you don't know who worked on it, good luck trying to find out who worked on it because nobody's going to cop up to it. And so this helps you talk to that person, provide better training. It also is important to know how much money they're spending on on wash and fold as well. One question is, how does your employee pay for the wash and fold? One way is you give them cash. So my recommendation is to get cash out of their hand as soon as possible. 
because it's just going to, it's just too tempting for the, for people to line their own pockets. So that's something I, I highly recommend is getting cash out of their hands. So are you using a card system? Are you using an app? So those really help you decrease your the chance of loss. That being said, if you have an employee who's making $12 an hour and they have a card or an app that could start an eight and a half dollar machine, that's a lot of temptation. One thing we do to help minimize that is machine tracking. So it's really important to track every order or actually every time they use a machine to an order. And that goes back to those machine tracking handouts. A lot of laundry owners use spiral notebooks to keep track of which machines they're using. And then that way you're able to track, okay, they spent 30 bucks, but they did all these different orders. And so I'll go ahead and go back. So that's one way of doing it. These are actually pretty fancy. Most places who are tracking the machines are doing it on spiral notebooks. And then they pay their manager to decipher it all because there's a lot of information there. And again, how often are you going to even audit all the stuff? So what we did in, in our software is we do the machine tracking automatically. So you can see on the top, it just says add dryer, add washer, and then it automatically, it already knows which employee it is. And the software is in the cloud, so you could access it anywhere. As the owner, you could see down below, you could see the machine tracking results. And so I could see on order number 19 at the bottom, on a $17 order, I mean, this is kind of made up, you know, data right here, but on a $17 order, the employee spent 15 bucks. And I could, I find that easily because I could see the percentage of this percentage is way too high. They spent too much money for the size of that order. So rather than looking through pages and pages of notes to see it, making sure, you know, they're using the right equipment mix, we're able to easily see making sure that they're using the right amount of machines for that size order. We have a nighttime shift because we're, we do a lot of pickup and delivery. So we pick up a bunch of clothes and then at 10 o'clock at night, we shut down the laundry to the public and we're doing laundry all the way until seven in the morning, doing thousands of pounds. One time we went at nighttime to just kind of check up on things and our attendants were bringing in, don't tell anyone, but they were bringing in their laundry bags into work. So what's going on there? So if you're not tracking the machines and, and the orders and when they're using the machines and tying that to an order, it's just very tempting that they're doing their personal laundry while they should be working or they're doing their friend's laundry while they're working. So you just wanna make sure you have the right controls in place just to avoid temptation. Most people are honest, but you don't want that one person who's gaming the system to lure morale because the other employees get jealous. Like, why does she do that when I don't? This right over here is productivity. And this goes back to that machine tracking. On those machine tracking forms, it does say how many pounds is each order. Again, with software, it's all automatic, but it is something you do want to track. If somebody's dedicated to doing wash and fold without distractions, they could do between like 250 to 300 pounds, but at least over 200. If you sometimes, if you push for too many pounds, mistakes start happening and you'll start seeing that. So then it's like, okay, you know what? At Super Suds, we're happy at 250 pounds during an eight hour shift. And a lot of people have all different numbers. So I don't even feel fully comfortable with saying our numbers because some people say, oh, we could do 500 pounds. And it's like, really? Everybody's gonna have different numbers, but you wanna know what your numbers are. In addition, if you're doing wash and fold, if you're just getting started, it's probably the same attendant who's on the floor doing it and they will be getting questions from customers and that comes first because the customer is right there there are a lot of distractions as you know so you can't really compare these numbers to an attendant who's manning the floor these numbers are for people who are just doing wash and fold and the 200 pounds 200, the 250 pounds i was talking about is during an eight hour shift and a big part is folding folding is labor intensive and I do see people, sometimes they're pricing it based upon wash and fold, thinking, well, my attendant is there anyway, so this is just extra money. But later on, when this turns into a business and you're bringing in all these, you have to hire a second attendant for the same shift to do laundry, then it's no longer just extra money. You really need to make sure that wash and fold maths out on its own. So you don't want to be undercharging. You want to come up with a fair price. Gratuity. It is really hard to hire people right now, as you know. You want to make sure your software allows you to take in tips, or if you're accepting credit cards or so, you just want something to accept tips. At Supersuds, because of tips, and customers are really, really generous. 
especially on pickup and delivery. Some people are just putting in $10 tips and $20 tips. People are generous. They're appreciative more than ever before. People, as a result of tips, our employers are getting a whole extra dollar per hour more because of tips. So that is a real, real blessing. And that helps with employer retention. Because if you have a good employee, you want to, yeah, you want to basically keep, take care of the guys you have. Something else on tips I want to mention, we don't do the tips per order. And the reason being is then that way, the attendants will just grab the orders with the biggest tips, or they might do something special for that order. Then they'll say, well, hey, why didn't you do that special thing last this time? And it's, oh, you didn't tip. We try and avoid that. We want every order treated special. The way we divvy up the tips is we do it by pounds laundered. So that's another reason to to just keep track of how many pounds they're laundering. I would just come up with a fair way of splitting up the tips. In addition, we use tips as a way of incentivizing. In order to qualify for tips, you need to do this, or you need to show up on time, or you need to do this. So for the next two weeks of tips, it's we divvy that out to the people who qualify for the tip. The tickets are a very valuable part. That's part of the presentation. And in the top left, you could see what our tips, not tips, what our tickets used to look like. And it's handwritten, you'll see crossouts. I mean, there we did say four packages, so that was good. But in the full picture, it actually had 38 pounds and it crossed out and then it's 39 or, and so it just wasn't very professional. And it's really easy to not get the customer's phone number or this or that. And, and you need that information. Part of the presentation, you want to have professional tickets with your logo on there. You need to print out the preferences. So we say use all free and clear. You can see that right there because not only is it important to follow the customer's preferences, it's important to convey that you follow their directions because otherwise they're going to question it. Did you remember to use free and clear? And so if it says it right there on the ticket, it helps provide that assurance. In addition, we get our tickets from cleaner supply on the back you could get the thermal ticket paper with some legal stuff on the back that helps minimize your risk. So it has terms and conditions. It basically says we don't owe you any more money than the total cost of the order. So there's a lot of things on there that help protect you that's automatically printed with every ticket. Here's one question, especially if you're getting started, is do I have my customers pay up front or do I have them pay when they pick up their clothes? The much better way of doing it is pay when you drop off your clothes. We call that pay now. And the reason why that's important is because that way you're guaranteed to get paid. And secondly, they're much faster at picking up their clothes than when they pay at pickup. Because the pay at pickup people might not have any money on them or they might be waiting for another paycheck. So that pay at pickup, those guys, those orders sometimes just languish and linger at your laundromat. And if you're like us, you could never have enough storage space. So if you want to keep your storage space minimized and not have one order just sitting there for a long time, that's why you should have customers pay up front. And if you currently are doing pay at pickup, you may want to consider stopping that or just grandfathering your existing customers over. A lot of, a lot of laundry owners have a tenant. They don't want to tell customers not to pay at pickup when they already got used to it. So if you're starting fresh, do it the right way, have them pay upfront. The second thing is we also allow people in our software to keep their credit card on file. So we call that express pay. So you look up a customer, you say, hi, Bob, and you bring up his profile and it'll show just like that green thing right there. It says use visa ending in 0027. So you could ask Bob, hey, you, you want to use a credit card you have on file? And those customers are way more loyal. I mean, imagine if you're going to Starbucks and you could go to Starbucks and they and you ask for a coffee and they just hand it to you and you walk out the door. That's what Express Pay is like versus going somewhere else and you have to pull out your wallet, you got to wait around and it just takes a lot longer. So one question is how often do people pay and not pick up? So it actually happens more than you think. I mean, not a ton, but maybe once a month, twice a month. In our software, we text people once the order's done. The software automatically texts them like three or seven days later at 14 days, at 21 days. It says the messages starting start getting more and more stern. At 30 days, we reserve the right to donate your clothes to charity. And we really hold on to it for a little bit longer than that. 
So the software does the dirty work in a way because we used to call customers and keep calling them and say, hey, could you pick up your clothes? Could you pick up your clothes? So now it's just automated and that used to be a whole job. Yeah, so we do donate quite a bit of clothes throughout the year to, to charity. Over here, we've got cash versus credit card. Very important to accept credit card. So this is at one month at our laundromat in store. We take in about $2,500 or $3,000 a month in cash for wash and fold. But take a look at the credit card. People like paying by credit card. So we're doing about $17,500 in credit card transactions. It's a huge upgrade. You know, I don't care if you get our software or Square or just something to accept credit cards, but if you don't accept credit cards, you should. How does the customer tip when using a credit card on file? In our software, you can have it, you can, mem you can have it memorized. Uh, when the customer, they actually interact with the kiosk and they could tap, 15% and then a button comes up, says, do you want to save that preference for future orders? A big part of Wash and Fold is even more than self-service. It's a different product. You're now in the service industry and the customers have different expectations. So self-serve, you know, you keep the place clean, you keep the machines working, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's important there. But in Wash and Fold, you're now moving into more of the service industry. It really goes a long way if you can remember the customer's preferences. Again, in our software, but it's other software too. That's why you need to go with something made for laundromats, not something generic. You, it usually has a way of remembering the customer's preferences. So in this picture, it says extra downy, Bob. If you ask the customer in the software, it'll tell you extra downy. But again, it's always good to convey that to the customer because they don't know your software knows it. So that you go, hey, you want extra downy like last time? And the customer gets real excited. Like, that's why I come here because you guys know who, know who I am and they have a relationship with you. The flip side of the software is keeping a history of the customer. So you can look up customer's history. And if you're just using paper tickets, and maybe I should have started with that, but I really don't believe paper tickets is the right way of going. People have really elevated their game. We used to do paper tickets with the triplicates, but it's a mess. There's so many mistakes that could happen, you know, with handwriting and this, it's just, and then if you lose that ticket, good luck. You don't have customer history. And speaking of customer history, we just had a situation where a customer said, you know, I'm really, really upset. I asked for my baby clothes to be hung and the, the adult clothes to not to be folded. And that was interesting. And, and we did it reverse. So I don't know how that happened, but it got reversed. And the customer was really upset. And it's just an odd request. And but that's fine. That was her request. And the customers are paying to get the clothes done the way they want it. What we did was we looked at this customer's history, and it turns out this customer spends like 150 bucks, a hundred bucks like every two weeks, they're a really, really good customer. So who cares about whether they're a writer, we're a writer, we made a little mistake. And, and so we offered her a $50 store credit. So if a customer's upset and the sorry doesn't go far enough, store credit is the way to go because then they come back to your laundromat. And again, the software, you could add store credit to their account and then it automatically gets applied to it. It automatically emails them that, hey, you now have store credit. But regardless, we gave her a $50 store credit and she was ecstatic. So, and to us is a no brainer because she's spending thousands of dollars with us every year. And then the flip side is if a first time customer comes in with a ridiculous complaint, you might not be so generous because they might just be trying to game the system, right? I mean, what's the chance they're complaining the first time they ever came there? And if you don't have a way of knowing if it's a long time customer or a first time customer, you know, then it's very hard to make these decisions. Over here, this is same day service. I recommend charging extra for same day service. We charge an extra 25 cents per pound. Even when you first start, it's a lot of places have the temptation of saying, well, you know, I could get it done same day anyways. Maybe they'll come back here more often if it's same day. So I, I might as well do it. And then you get in the habit of doing same day service. But guess what? If you're doing the website and you're doing all those things, you're gonna get busier. And then later on, you're not gonna offer same day service. And that customer you thought you were hooking up, you actually trained to expect same day service. 
So what I recommend is don't offer same day service unless they pay for it. So don't even tell them the laundry's done until the next day. And if they want it the same day, then have them pay an extra quarter per pound. In our software, one of the common mistakes is if you do charge an extra 25 cents per pound, most of the time your attendant is not gonna charge them. So in our software, if you choose the pickup time and day to the same day, it automatically adds that 25 cents or whatever amount you choose. And it's just automatic. So when things are not automatic, they tend not to happen because the attendant doesn't wanna be the bad guy and say, oh, that would be cost extra. As far as hiring employees, some of our sources are indeed.com, facebook.com, snagajob.com. We're, I'm going to be interviewing Kent Wells on the, my podcast coming up in a couple weeks. So that podcast is at youtube.com forward slash curbside laundries. But I just want to tell you kind of sneak preview of what's going to happen on that because he's got some really good systems that I've tried firsthand at work. Number one, he does a pay range. If you're hiring somebody at 12 bucks an hour, he'll put a range on there on indeed.com saying 12 to $15 an hour. And then when they call, you could ask, well, do you have folding experience? Have you worked at a laundromat before? No, no, no. Okay, well, we're gonna start off at 12, but work your way up. By doing a range, it'll get you more phone calls. It'll get you more return on your do- advertising dollars to find an employee. The second part that was just brilliant that he had is, He refers to his employees as internal customers. So once again, that's internal customers. He refers to his regular customers as external customers. So he sees it as, if I keep my internal customers happy, I'm going to make more money. That was a big aha moment for me because I realized sometimes egos clash with owners and employees like, hey, you should do what I say or this or that. And you might treat somebody differently. Hey, I just expect you to do it, right? But if you're looking at it from the term of, hey, if I keep that customer, that employee happy, these are the things that are important to that employee, that goes a long ways. And your retention is going to go way higher and you're going to make a whole bunch more money because it takes a lot of time to train somebody, to get somebody up to speed on folding clothes quickly and being good with the customers, all those things. And it also takes a lot of time to hire people because a lot of people who are looking for jobs They're not really looking for a job. They're looking for an interview so they could tell the unemployment office, I'm looking for a job. So they don't show up. And that's another thing. I never meet an employee at SuperSuds unless I text them ahead of time or they text me. So when I'm scheduling an appointment, I tell them, you know, we've had a number of no-shows. So I'm only going to show up at SuperSuds if you text me an hour, a few hours before our appointment or I text you to confirm. And that way I'm not driving all the way out there and then it's a no-show. So this way, if you text them ahead of time, you get their confirmation, then that way when you go there, you know you're not wasting your time. And it could also give the employee an opportunity to demonstrate that they're responsible. Because, and you could even tell them like, you know, if you text me, that's bonus points, you know, because that shows they took initiative. This is for dry cleaning. And I recommend only doing dry cleaning if you're doing pickup and delivery. And by saying doing dry cleaning, I'm assuming you're outsourcing dry cleaning to a dry cleaner. And I've got a podcast on that as far as how to create the relationship with the dry cleaner and all that. So we could do a deep dive on that later. The reason why you shouldn't do it if you're only doing it at the store is because somebody's going to bring in one laundered and pressed shirt and you don't make any money on those. You make the money on the dresses and the pants and, you know, the other garments. The dress shirts are the loss leader. And so somebody will just bring in one or two shirts. You're making like 50 cents or a quarter. And then by the time you drive to the dry cleaner and all that, you're losing money. With pickup and delivery, you're able to say, hey, there's a $35 order minimum and they're not gonna give you 35 dress shirts. You know, they're, they're gonna give you a mix of stuff, including wash and fold. Dry cleaning could be pretty lucrative and could help you get additional customers. And the good news is you don't have to do the work. You could just drop the clothes off at the dry cleaner. I do like dry cleaning. I just don't want you to get stuck in it if it's just for, if you're only doing in-store wash and fold. We're just kind of wrapping up here, but this on top is the folding board. So if you're like me and you can't fold clothes, that's one way of doing it. They sell it on Amazon. You know, I brought it into Super Suds, but they kind of laughed it off because it it was fast for me, but for them, that took way too long. But if you need some additional assistance with folding, that's one option. The other thing you see on the bottom is helping hands. So if you're folding sheets, what we found at Super Suds is when we had two of our attendants working together, 
they are able to fold sheets more than twice as fast. But if you got one person or you just want everybody to be independent, that's a pretty good little device that allows one person to be really efficient. One of our things to keep in mind is we are in the low volume, high margin business. So I, I see some laundry owners really excited because they get a hundred bed hotel, but it's just a matter of time until they find out that somebody like Cintas could do it for a lot cheaper. Our sweet spot for hotels are like 20 beds or less. These huge accounts with real low margins, let somebody else get those. We're all about the high margin and lower volume, but it's good volume for us. And the nice part about commercial accounts, they're consistent. They wind up giving you more pounds. So once again, on your website, I would focus some effort on getting those commercial accounts because those are really good, really good to get. And they're, uh, but the residential we found is our bread and butter and the commercial accounts are the icing on the cake. And then some additional resources, something very valuable. I learned a ton on Facebook from other laundry owners, like, you know, from everybody, everybody has something you can learn something from. And the great part about Facebook is you might have a question about something, how, you know, an error code or this or that, and you could post on Facebook and you're gonna get a bunch of responses. So it's like, you're just connected to the entire community. And these groups have like 2000 people on them. So there's the laundromat owner showcase, the laundromat how-to, laundromat owners. I mean, there's probably like two or three other really big ones. And I recommend joining. I mean, to be honest, I wouldn't be on Facebook if it wasn't for <laughs> curbside laundries or, you know, super suds or th these Facebook groups. But it, that alone makes it worthwhile for me. That really wraps it up. So once again, on curbsidelaundries.com, you could see some of the webinars done in the past. Some are focused just on commercial laundry. Some are focused just on how to get started with pickup and delivery. And then I'm doing a podcast where the goal is, is to have five minute videos, each one with, with a takeaway. And, and that's at youtube.com forward slash curbside laundries. And then, and then once again, at curbside laundries, we do the in-store point of sale, pickup and delivery, and then also the laundromat website that's dialed in to help you grow your business.